Okay, so uh, we're here with Richard Birugeva. I thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Uh, Richard has been the head of NSSF in Uganda and created an enormous shift in actually changing around NSSF. Uh, it had been going through some difficult times and the perception in the marketplace was pretty negative with three managing directors uh, and also previous chairman and also boards uh, thrown in jail or disbanded. Uh, there were significant problems at the time you took over and since then it's really gone from strength to strength. Uh, the customer perception has massively improved, the asset base has massively improved, uh, the information given to uh, customers, uh, so many different areas have improved. So I'd like to talk with you just to get some ideas of uh, what has happened to create that. Uh, one thing I'm very pleased is to have had the chance to work with you and to have done a range of training with yourself and the board and the top management team. Uh, but I'd like to uh, have this chance for you to share with any viewers some of the keys that have led you to really shift NSSF and what has happened. So maybe if you can start off by just telling us uh, how has NSSF improved? Well, thank you so much, Tony, for uh, having me. and. Um it's been um, a wonderful three and a half years uh, being at the fund. Um, it, first of all, uh, was run for a long time as if it were a government department, mm -hmm. and that meant that we didn't care about the customers. So one of the things we, we did is to try and reorient uh, staff, change staff mentality towards the customer. And I remember that the first uh, management meetings I would have, I would say, uh, guess who is the most important person in this company? And obviously they would say the board, they would say the minister, <laughs> they would say the managing director, they would say the ex senior executive committee, and I would say, no, guess what? The guy who is the most important guy, the guy who puts food on your table, is the customer. And therefore, everything you got to do, got to be around the customer. So obviously we had to do that going through the values, uh, our values, looking at the, the strategy, there was also a little bit of luck on our part, the fact that uh, the industry was also changing. So there was this whole new drive around liberalization. So for me it was very important to then share with the rest of the team what happens in an organization which is um, in a liberalized environment where you're competing for customers, where you're no longer the monopoly and therefore you've got to pay attention to the products that you offer, you've got to pay attention to the, to the service that you provide, you got to pay attention to the data, right? Simple things like yeah. schedules would come in, um, schedules with people's money, and it would be put in a drawer and forgotten all about, and the check would be sent to the bank, the check would clear, and then wouldn't find the schedule. So you had money, which you didn't know who it belonged to. Or sometimes you had the schedule, but you didn't know where the money was because the check had been put in the drawer and it had gone stale after six months. So those simple things, all right, trying to, to change the mentality, um, and then we looked at the data. Data was a big, big issue, as I said, uh, with uh, staff totally not caring how long it took to update customer statements. We said statements have to be introduced and updated within 48 hours. The other things that we also did was to try and monitor all that. We also introduced a management information system, which was real time. So we began tracking every single thing from sales, uh, from how many customers they had seen, how many customers they had uh, uh, interacted with, uh, up to the stage whereby we were now able to provide all that. Um, we then did what I believe is a, a real clever thing, especially within the Ugandan market. For a very long time, employers had stopped trusting us. Uh, employees had also stopped trusting us. So the other thing we did is that we introduced three programs. The first one was a simple one. Uh, we called it the amnesty campaign. We went to the employer and we said, for a long time you might not have been uh, compliant with providing uh, us uh, remittances on behalf of your employees. And there is a 10% penalty we charge for customers uh, who have not paid their money. So we said, if you come to us and tell us you've been a naughty boy, we will, or girl, we will forgive you that 10% interest 
so long as you pay all the contributions that you should have done on behalf of your employees. That worked very well. Over a thousand employers came forward on a database of about 10,000. So about 10% of our employees came, of our employers, sorry, came and told us that they had been bad yeah. and we forgave them their interest. The second one, we gave uh, a whistleblower campaign to the employees themselves and we said, if your employer has not paid money on your behalf, you come to us. We will pay you money for reporting your employer. We will not tell him who has told us. We will go in and do an audit and we will recover your money. And guess what? You will have money in your pocket and you will also recover all the money that you should have done. And guess what? Very, very successful. Over 9,000 employees came forward and said and reported and we recovered over 50 billion shillings. 50 that, billion shillings. 50 billion shillings. So that's 10 million dollars? Yes. Yeah. The third one was magical. Um, for a long time, we had the NSSF Act. All right? Everybody knows about it. In there, if you as the employer does not pay on behalf of your employees, guess what happens? We, NSSF, can take you to jail, but we've got to prove in court that you actually haven't paid that. So it was taking very long to actually take people to court. So employers would say, Forget it. I don't care what you're talking about. Try and prove it that I'm not taking these things. And because of record keeping, because we're not good at what we're doing, it was taking us very long to even take people to jail. Right? So what did we do? We introduced the relationship management model. And how did this work? We basically said, we've got three categories of customers. The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so who are the good? The good employers are the ones who consistently pay for their employees. Who are the bad? The bad are the ones who are not consistent, have missed some months. And the ugly are the ones who have stopped completely paying. And we said we will create a team of two relationship managers. Those who deal with the good customers and those who deal with the bad and the ugly customers. So we told the relationship manager, this is your portfolio of customers. The good, what is your objective? Your objective is to extract the maximum value and also make sure that the customer service that you provide to these employees is the very best in the class. They're the good cops. They're the good cops, <laughs> yes. So you've got to really pamper them because they're the good customers. The bad and the ugly, the relationship manager's role is to turn them into good or from ugly into bad and then from bad into good. Okay? So that was it. This meant that our relationship managers, who used to be called compliance officers, suddenly have now a new perception. Right? This now becomes a sales job. This is now target based based on targets, based on the number of sales you do, all right? And suddenly all these kids who were working as compliance officers, walking around with a big stick, they now have a carrot. And the carrot is to try and convince all these bad and ugly customers into good. And that's more rewarding and more remunerating than that. So that meant that we sorted out the customer side, we gave them a good customer service, we gave the ability to the employee to report on the employer. We gave the employer to report themselves. And the result of that is that we doubled our collections within a period of two to three years. Um, so not, uh, in terms of collections, what are the figures? The figures moved up from about 28 billion shillings that we're collecting in a month to over 52, 53 billion shillings mm -hmm. that, so we, about, that we're correct uh, to. 10, 11 to about 24 million dollars. Yes, 24 yeah. million dollars. Okay. So if you now look at, at the business model, we have sorted out the front office. The front office is introduce a relationship management model, reorganize your, sale, your people into sales groups, right? improve customer service, improve the turnaround times by reskilling your staff, okay? and changing the whole concept, uh, how they look at the customer by com becoming customer centric. You've then sorted out your front office. How do you then supplement that? 
we then went to the back office and what did we do we introduced the uh, website we introduced the mobile phone we introduced all um, uh, telephone bank uh, tele telephone cells uh, and we're able to then offer a customer uh, uh, alternative channels uh, which they then could be able to assess their balances not only did we do that we also went to the data site which was a very big problem we put in places we hired actually about a hundred temps and they've been working in there cleaning the statements so at the end of the period we had 90 percent clean statements and that meant and that beforehand it was beforehand you know 10 percent so we've dealt with the front office so then with the back office we've gone through the series of uh, of those of those things i've just talked about um and um Therefore, you now have a complete, uh, a complete picture, which basically deals with the front office. You've then dealt with your back office. You put in all these terms who've dealt with your data. Mm -hmm. The data is much cleaner. Your customers are much happier. The then the, the next area was to so just in terms of that for the layman. Mm. When you're talking about clean data, I presume what you're saying is beforehand yes. only about ten percent of customers had Cleans. accurate. Records, records, yeah, absolutely. So you could really tell exactly yes. how much has been paid in, yes. how much is owed, yes. and you shifted that to ninety. Yes, ninety percent. Yeah, with, 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 yeah, with the intention of actually getting it to a hundred percent. Yeah, they'll probably do that within the next uh, three months. Yeah, and um, a critical thing yes. for a pension. Abs fund. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, then the other thing, of course, we did was to try and then uh, change uh, the whole concept of uh, risk and control. Right. For a very long time, the fund never had an unqualified audit report, right? It only happened three years ago. Uh, and for the last three years, we've had now an unqualified audit report, uh, which again comes from the fact that we've improved on our controls. And um, that shows by the fact that we've been able to turn the area around audit and uh, uh, reduce, improve the control environment. And uh, as a result of that, have an unqualified audit uh, opinion uh, given by the auditor general. Now, so that's on the business side. We then went back into our efficiency side, and there we've done quite a lot of things. We reduced the cost of doing business. Um, it used to be about 80% cost to income ratio. In other words, for every 100 shillings, we spent 80 shillings of those. We've reduced that to about 16%. Uh, so that means that the, the difference is then given to our members as interest paid to them. And therefore, we've had to increase the interest from 6%, which we were paying in the past, to almost 12% that we paid uh, at the end of the period. And that has come out of all the improvements that we've uh, done on the business side, reducing the cost of doing business um, by outsourcing quite a lot of things, um, you know, bringing down the fleet of cars. We used to have 100 cars, bringing them down to less than 30, uh, closing some branches, which we believed we're not adding value uh, to the to the business. So we had 25 branches. We, we've reduced that to about 20 branches with a view to concentrating on the main areas where we're getting our business. Uh, then uh, improving... So in terms of that, you increased the uh, interest rate for yes. members from 6% to yes, 12%. To 12%, yeah. If you look at that in terms of after inflation, yes. what were the figures? Well, the infl the, let's put it into perspective. The 12, the 10 year average inflation rate was 10%. Yeah. All yeah. right? At so the time we. from basically losing 4% yes, after yeah, inflation yes, yes. to increasing it. Increasing it to, to, to about 2 percentage points above inflation. Right. So that's on the, on the return to members. And we've been able to do that, as I said, by increasing the efficiencies, uh, improving on the, reducing the cost of doing business, and, and also improving on the on the outreach, okay? Although we closed five offices to bring them to about 20, but we've increased on the outreach centers. And outreach centers are branches that we actually open on certain days of the month, but they're not fully opened all the time, all right? The beauty with that is that then you can double heart your staff. So if they were working in this outreach center today, tomorrow they can work in the other outreach center. It's the same staff, but then you're providing a service to your customers. Because we found that in some places, we don't have enough customers to be able to be there on a 24-7 uh, basis. So 
for example, uh, there are branches in the north of this country where you need to be there, say, once or twice a month, okay, rather than being there uh, no, every day. 365 days. Uh, right. And that model has worked very, very well. It reduces your cost of doing business, you still provide the service, and yet you're being more efficient and deploying your resources where they actually require yeah. Okay, so some massive improvements yes. and uh, the perception when I talk with people has really changed. Yes. So before people weren't trusting NSSF. Yes. So when we did the training for your board and the yes. top management team, one of the things that I think really surprised the, uh, the team and the board was our results showing that 80% of the people we interviewed mm. would probably move their mm. funds to yeah. stand or yeah. standard chartered yeah. if they had the choice yes. when the sector was liberalized. Okay. And we had a powerful video that really uh, demonstrated that. Yeah. Nowadays, what would you say is the percentage of people that are intending to stay with the fund? Well, I'll give you the numbers of the percentage of, of satisfaction that we've seen. Yeah. Uh, before I took over the fund, uh, the satisfaction rates were less than 45 percent, right? In other words, four and a half people believe that the fund was okay. Um, today, more than 80 percent of our customers are happy with our service. So that shows you that there's been a turnaround in the perception. There's been a turnaround. Uh, one of the things that we did was to rebrand, right? Uh, kill the old logo and introduced a new brand. But the the new brand was about uh, uh, a uh, rebirth, uh, a new promise to our customers, a promise to provide them a good service, and that uh, works has worked wonders and magic within the minds uh, of the customers. And if you look at the positive uh, letters, you know, letters are normally negative, but customers have been writing in positive letters saying that you know, if today uh, the NSSF were to be in a liberalized environment, they would actually keep their business with us. Incidentally, when I, uh, if I'm preparing the uh, presentation for you when uh, the board is uh, considering a renewal of contract, mm -hmm. one of the things that I do want to include is a picture with you really personifying the fund. Yes, yes. You have personified the fund and it's certainly one of the things that I would hope they're considering mm -hmm. when they're looking uh, for the next contract to them. I'll, act I'll actually tell you a little yeah. story. Uh, at the end of last year, we had a staff annual uh, party, and we'd asked the staff to vote, okay, on the person they believe personified the NSSF, and all the staff yeah. voted me yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a person whom personified, and that was, you know, in spite of the fact that, um, you know, it was a free, yeah. free, and the, it was all done in whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yes, uh, you can say that uh, yeah. at the time. And really, you are the first NSSF MD that's being respected and appreciated rather than vilified. Well, <laughs> I'm the first uh, uh, managing director of NSSF also in recent times to have completed their contracts yeah. and left uh, with a, uh, without uh, being handcuffed. <laughs> yes, so congratulations. Yes. Yes. Uh, good. So one of the things that I'd also like to talk about is the impact of the training that we yes, did. So yes. uh, we, I worked very closely with you one-on-one. Uh, mm -hmm. -on -one. I uh, even provided advice in terms of the parliamentary yes, bill. Yes. Uh, I worked with the board, yes. with the senior management team. I, I trained a very huge number of the top management, mm -hmm. uh, and we looked at various uh, elements, including change management, etc. Now, tell me just briefly uh, how you feel that work made a difference to NSSF? Well, the thing is, it contributed to the shock element, right? Because everybody, when they are in their own situation, they are happy with it. They do not believe there is another way of doing it. Uh, and therefore, the training that you provided uh, did first of all begin off with the shock element that today uh, if uh, there was another company that was offering what NSF currently provides you know would lose 80% of our customers it was clear right the, the people you had interviewed were people you found on the street and that was pretty obvious to my colleagues 
and the senior management team that uh, you know we were going to lose them i'm sure they knew but they didn't know uh, the second thing was you also came with a lot of examples about some of what the other companies in the world had done in uh, response to changing environments so for me it then became very easy in the day-to-day -day management of the fund to refer to your training and continuously remind people that guess what if we as a company do not change the way we're doing business if we as a company do not appreciate our customers uh, it doesn't matter you know how much the minister thinks about us it doesn't matter what the board thinks about us it doesn't matter what senior management thinks about us what really really matters is what the customers think and how we are providing the service to them so for me that training that you provided that interaction that shock element that you provided to my colleagues was quite important in making sure that i had a much easier role in trying to convince my colleagues to actually change and also to point them in the right direction. And do you feel that it did create a, a real change in the overall perception? Well, of the I think it did, right, I did. It also made it very easy for us to deal with some of the resistance that we had, uh, especially with some of the senior managers, uh, which led to some of them actually leaving, which was not a, an, uh, an irregrettable le uh, loss. Uh, and, and therefore, for me, uh, it did help in, 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 in articulating our cause and also improving on the, the, the mission that we had of trying to transform and turn around the fund uh, to what I believe is, is now a good institution that provides a reasonable service to the customer. So I actually approached you even before you started with yes. NSFF and yes. gave you some materials yes. and some of the elements that yes. are very worthwhile doing before you start a yes. major role like that. Yes. Now, in the first few months, you came up with a lot of terrific ideas yes. that were very important for yes. the company. Yes. You mentioned some of those like changing uh, both the name and the focus from yes. compliance officer yes. Yes. to relationship manager, yeah. and there are a number of other key components. Mm. You mentioned to me before the board meeting that you thought it was actually fairly unlikely that you'd get all the changes yes, through. Yeah. Uh, so what changed uh, in terms of the, the work that I did? How did that actually shift the board and the decision that it actually ended up eventuating? Well, what I, what I think is that because of the dynamics of the board, right, um, again because of the shock element, because of the fact that uh, some of the board had not been involved in change management situations. Some of the board had not gone through a situation whereby uh, they were dealing with a company that was uh, a government institution but wanted to have a private sector outlook. Um, the training you provided helped change some of those minds. So it was quite uh, 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 obvious to the board and eventually to, uh, to the rest of the team that we needed to make those changes and therefore a lot of the changes that we're proposing uh, were then supported uh, after they had attended some of that training. I actually came up with a new product which I call the unfair advantage and it's essentially based on the work that I did for you yeah. where what I'm now offering to other managing directors is that if there's a change that they want or there's a perception that needs to be changed in the firm as long as I feel that indeed it is in the advantage of the firm and of other staff, then I will actually create a training program. It might just be an hour, it could be longer, but I'll create a context in which the board or whatever team they're presenting to, or even customers, get to the point where it's like, well, yes, of course we have to do this. Mm. And so by getting people to come up with those ideas themselves, mm whether it's through discussions as part of a training, whether it's through the shock element of mm. creating uh, videos and processes and getting people to realize what needs to be done. Mm. The idea of this <laughs> unfair advantage is that by working with the managing director and going through that process, whoever is being presented to the board or whomever, you can almost predict 
that they will go along with the idea. So I should thank you for uh, providing the context in which I was able to do that and come up with that new product. Fantastic. And I'm very glad to hear that it did make a difference. Yeah. Now, you gave me a testimonial which I greatly appreciated and whenever I show it to people, I tell them not to believe you. Mm. I tell them that you're being way too positive mm. and that the credit you're giving me uh, is misplaced that really it's far more you that mm. did the work. Mm. Uh, but nevertheless, I do appreciate the sentiment. Mm. So this is what you had uh, said to me. You were saying that because of the work in training our board and executive managers, mm. that an SSF will survive and prosper. Mm. Without it, we would have stagnated, been far less effective, mm. and our reputation would have remained very badly damaged. Instead, we have already hit two trillion shillings in assets and are on the way to two billion dollars in assets. Mm. I'd say 70% of the credit for this goes to your work. Mm. I don't think I would have got the changes accepted if it weren't for you. You set the stage, you created the understanding and the thinking that led to everything we needed to do being agreed on. It was brilliant. Mm. So, first of all, uh, how many shillings in assets are you now at? Three, three point, actually almost four trillion shillings right. uh, in assets. Uh, so and you actually are very much on your way to two billion dollars in assets. And uh, yes, uh, 1.6 1. Uh, billion dollars yeah. uh, in assets. And that was only achieved uh, at the end of uh, last year. Uh -huh. So uh, definitely the, those numbers um, are well within reach now. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so, uh, you still agree that the work we did was an important part? Well, it was an important part at that time, uh, because yeah. we, needed, we needed to crystallize that change. We needed to get the board on board. Yeah. To me, the most important thing was getting the board and senior management on board, because then the rest became very easy. Uh, I also think that we created a lot of uncomfortable time for some of the people who uh, were not uh, fit for purpose, uh, and suddenly a lot of them perhaps have uh, left uh, along the way. Because well, some people in your position would have seen the liberalization of the pension sector, taking away your monopoly yes. and giving the customers the chance to go with anyone they wished, of those who were yes. approved obviously yeah. as pension funds, they would have seen that as an enormous threat. Yes. And I think one of the things that we both tried to work together on... Is that actually is an opportunity? Exactly. It's a, it's a big opportunity and uh, uh, that's the only way I can look at it because what it also means is that when the new law comes into place that liberalizes the sector, guess what it will do? It will lower the minimum amount of employees that a company needs to have before it begins contributing for NSSF uh, to zero. Right? If, in other words, every company, whether, regardless of whether they've got one or five people, mm -hmm. they'll have to register for NSSF or a scheme that will be there at the time. Yeah. And therefore, that is an opportunity, an enormous opportunity. There is over 11 million Ugandans uh, who are gainfully employed, uh, so the statistics say, but we also know that there's only 1.5 million members that are members of NSSF, and only half a million of those are actually active. So if we were to widen the net, there's a lot more opportunity for the NSSF. Obviously, the target would be some of our good customers, but also there's a lot of op other opportunities that would come as a result of that. And we could actually ring fence them yeah. Uh, by changing the organization, being customer-centric, having good processes that make sure that the statements are updated, that information is available to the customer, and that they're happy with us, and therefore they would retain, uh, would retain that business. And all this has to come because we've got a good business model that is run very well, and also we've got a change management process that we've implemented and ready to shoot us into the new dispensation of competition. And so of the one and a half million customers you have now, that's only, what, about 5% of the population? Absolutely. Which is tiny yes. when you are meant to have every Absolutely. in the Absolutely. country. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So one other element that was a little bit of an issue for you in those early years was a particular senior board member who had, I think, a very different personality style than yourself. Mm. And he was very much more focused on uh, bureaucratic government style of running the fund, whereas what was necessary 
uh, particularly with the fact of being liberalised, was that the staff and the way of operating the fund was seeing it as a business mm -hmm. that needed to keep and attract customers, that needed to be competitive, and that had to focus not on a few big people in government, but on how everyone thinks about the fund. Now, one of the challenges that you had was that that particular person, as well as some other key people, were a little bit concerned about your style of management because you were very uh, enthusiastic, very keen, lots of great ideas, you were wanting to change things. And the perception I got was that that antagonism was creating some real obstacles in you achieving your own because people were personalising it. They were seeing it not as, what does the fund need to do, but oh, do we go with this person or do we go with Richard? And so that's why I did that process, dividing you up into different groups, uh, physically moving in the room, and talking about it not from the perspective of personality, but from the perspective of what is needed when a market goes through the sorts of changes that NSSF was, changed, uh, was uh, going through. Did that work of talking about different styles of management make a di big difference in how people saw you? I think that it worked in a part because people then recognized that I was actually a different person. Mm -hmm. But I also believe that there was some genuine respect created because um, a lot of what was happening uh, then uh, people felt that um, I had done before and therefore they respected me for that so it was much easier for me to continue with a different style from what perhaps some of the senior people uh, within the board uh, felt um, the compromise eventually became we will have a bureaucratic board okay what that means is that we will get all the rules implemented we'll have all the rules approved but then when we go to run the business we will have a different approach okay so we'll get in the relationship management model we'll get in the sales model we'll get in the first name basis model We'll get in the sort of relaxed model. We'll get in the sort of enthusiastic model. We'll introduce uh, a performance-based culture, uh, which which allows people to then be able to be paid uh, based on their on their deliverables rather than on the one check at uh, the one thirteenth check, right? Which used to go to everybody, right? That 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 used to be, but this became performance-based. Um, and it, it was tough initially introducing it, but mm. I think because of the respect that they had for me uh, and, and the realization that they were slightly different from me, I think the two then helped us to be able to then to implement and put some of the changes that we had to. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what worked and also maybe what didn't work in coming into a company with this extremely conservative parastatal, government-focused mentality that also had a lot of corruption and that had a number of people that were not really focused on helping the customer, but focused on helping themselves. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that worked in terms of changing that? And, and also some things you needed to be aware of that might, you might advise other people in similar situations to do? Very good. Um, I, on hindsight, I now recognize that a lot of the stuff that worked is the stuff that we had control over. Right? We had control over the customers. We had control over our costs. We had control over our delivery to the customers. Uh, we had control over the the data. Right? Because we could put bodies, we could put systems, we could put things in place. We had control over the turnaround time of paying of benefits uh, because we put bodies in, we looked at the process flow, we saw that this is how we could improve it. The things we failed to have control over is we realized that where we relied, especially on external people, for example, contractors, right? We failed, for example, to build, right? We thought we would re rejuvenate a lot of the uh, housing projects uh, that the fund had, 
We failed to do that because we were relying on contractors, we were relying on the PPDA, we were relying on the, uh, the Office of the Solicitor General, things like that, where there were external people involved. Uh, we also found that, for example, uh, we constantly were then taken to the IGG, all right? Whistleblowers wrote to the IGG and said, oh, well, there's something happening here, so, you know, don't allow it to happen. And Inspector we General Yes, uh, Inspector General of Government. And we felt that that was not because there was something happening, but because people were jealous and they didn't want these things to go through, uh, either for their own selfish reasons or because they felt that they were not involved uh, and therefore they wouldn't benefit from it. So we, that's where we felt that we'd actually missed out. Uh, but on the areas where we had control, where we had our own people, where we, we introduced in the systems and we did, we felt we went through. So the areas where it was out of our control, that's where we basically failed. Just very roughly, what percentage of staff would you guess were corrupt in the past? It's a very difficult question to answer um, because, you know, I keep telling people we've been able to change the fund within the three, pe three years, three and a half years. And I can say that 90% of the staff were the staff that we found there. So we've brought in a few new people, especially in the top management positions uh, and in our exco. But a lot of the kids that we've used to turn the institution around were the kids we found there. Mm -hmm. And these kids have been able to respond to the changes that we wanted the, them to make and they've, they've actually made it work. Which then tells me that there were very few bad apples. Uh -huh. It was right? a bad context, a bad environment. Okay, but of course, made people. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, well, I shouldn't say made people, but created a strong inducement. Inducement, for yes, yeah, for, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's why I think that there were few. Uh, and if you do change the environment, if you pay people well, because we actually changed the way we remunerate people. We benchmarked ourselves, for example, uh, against uh, the, uh, the financial services industry, like, uh, like banks and insurance companies. And once we began remunerating people well, once we introduced the bonus schemes, once we told them that you'll be paid because of your performance rather than because of, you know, everybody's got to have a, a 13th paycheck, then we saw that the actual re people responded. So these are ordinary kids uh, who basically just had bad leadership. I mean, as you know, I even work with rebels mm. who have led to the deaths of millions of people. Yes. And I work with them to change their thinking. Mm. And what a lot of people, they have this black and white mentality. Mm. You're either good or you're bad. Mm. And so they don't believe it's possible to create much change. Yes. But the reality is for the vast, vast majority of people, there's a mixture. Mm. They're essentially good people, mm. but if the environment supports them in being corrupt, rewards them for being corrupt, oh, if, yeah. it does, if it punishes them for doing the right thing, mm. you know, if you blow the whistle and you, you mention that someone is corrupt and then you're the one that is taken to court yes. or set up yes. or whatever, then clearly the corruption will continue. Mm. And what I find quite strange is that for many, many companies and many managing directors, there doesn't seem to be a sufficient awareness of the importance of creating an environment in which things will work. Yes. Uh, I was talking with a managing director of a very major corporation in Uganda just a few days ago, and he's thinking of leaving the company he's working with because the environment has been so negative. Mm. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd advised uh, you before you started at NSSF uh, in the advice I was, was giving was that if anyone does need to be laid off, it would be great to do it before you start. Yes. And in this particular case, uh, three days after the managing director started, uh, he was forced to lay off lots of people, mm. which of course made him be seen as the bad guy and really created enormous uh, problems for him. And one thing I went through with him is to look at how the environment determines the figures. I mean, just as an example, if NSSF was to maintain the same type of management and board that it had before you started, uh, I think you were saying you felt the company may have gone broke. 
or yes. at least stagnated? Well, yes, it would have stagnated, uh, I would have believed, and, and um, may, may, maybe wouldn't have been able to fulfill uh, its money. I mean, it, it might have stayed there, but, but you know, just hanging in there. Uh -huh. uh, the expenses were rising uncontrollably. Um, the, the profits that they distributed to their members was, was reducing, and they were in danger of uh, basically being uh, verified by the public and uh, basically being denied uh, business opportunities. So I think, yes, uh, in, in some ways, you know, if, if it had continued in, in that, that regard, yeah. uh, there, could, there could be issues. And yet, having changed the environment, you now have assets that are almost a billion dollars more yes. than it was before. Yes, absolutely. Why do you think so few managing directors actually put a monetary value on creating that change in the working environment, in the, the, the general approach of staff, their level of proactivity, their customer focus, their focus on excellence, and all of these things? I think that many companies make the, the mistake of not monetizing. Um, you know, if, if you talk to me at any moment in, in my career or in uh, any business I've worked with, I like the numbers, right? What do the numbers mean? Um, you know, if we are making sales, uh, what does each particular sale bring in and how much does it cost us? Uh, how can we do to increase the margin? Uh, how can we do to reduce our costs? How can we do to increase the efficiency? How can we make sure that we've got the right people doing the right job, right? And then putting a number to that particular activity. Mm -hmm. And I find that by doing that, you can then communicate to the lowest level uh, of the organization and be able to actually say, you know, you just can't say uh, that you, you're doing this because it will not add value to the company. Actually, by doing whatever you're doing, you're going to add five shillings extra. And therefore, people begin to associate their actions to their results. And, and that's very important because then it motivates people, it, it gives people a, a clear direction, and every single moment uh, when they're working for that organization, they, are know, they know that their, their action is actually contributing to the bottom line. And therefore, it's very easy to defend when you're either reducing this or making this change, and that's what the, the change is going to be. When I was working with MT in Rwanda, the main telecommunications company there, one of the things that I did was to have people look at their salary yes. uh, who were in customer service and to then change the way they thought about it mm. so that they would consider how much each negative customer was worth to them. Yes, yes. And if you think of a negative customer coming in and saying, oh, here's a couple of thousand shillings, in order for you to listen to me complaining. Yes. You have a different approach yes. than if you think, well, yes. I'm getting nothing for dealing yes, with yes, it. Yes. But also, as you say, within a, a company, by monetizing the importance of different factors, you yes. can work out where the best investment yes. lies. Okay. And very, very frequently, the best investment is in intangibles. Mm. Uh, where I think a lot of people make a mistake is that if it's not tangible, mm. they go, it's too hard, we'll ignore it. Yeah. So, uh, very quickly, some of the things that uh, I also did for you uh, were we did a lot of follow-up over a number of months after the program. Mm -hmm. And so this is an example of uh, one of the things uh, that I gave. So we are mentioning, for example, that uh, some of the things that you were talking about, some of the ways in which the staff were perceiving things, and what would happen in the future mm -hmm. as people realized the impact of the changes. Mm -hmm. First of all, do you think that we were fairly accurate in the prediction? Uh, we were predicting that what would happen is people initially are somewhat shocked, that they then go into a denial about the importance of these elements. They then maybe get a bit angry uh, at the changes, at you, at the company, but that they would then move through to actually accepting uh, finally the changes and then ideally uh, getting to a place of personal responsibility where they looked at what can I do? I think that's a very good, uh, very good um, characterization of the emotions that the change process uh, did go through. Um, and, you know, it, it would be interesting to see 
uh, what people think now uh, at the very end. But I do know that a lot of people then appreciated things like the relationship management model. Yeah. People then appreciated the whole issue around uh, some of the amnesties we brought in place, yeah. some of the change in, uh, in, in, for example, the reduction in the fleet of motor vehicles, uh, the restructuring of branches, uh, closing some of those branches. So although they appeared to be painful at the beginning, yeah. uh, the concentration on data, although that appeared to be uh, very difficult in the beginning, uh, people did actually uh, accept that that's, those are the changes they needed to make. And uh, a lot of people are, are happy with the progress that has been done. They're saying it's all due to the initial change that we brought in and some of the things that uh, they're now experiencing as uh, some of the success. So when I was in India, I was running a major conference there with someone in Fortune magazine called The Fifth Most Powerful Man in India, uh, someone called Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. While I was there, I got a book for you. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so this is a, a present for you. Thank you. Mr. Jobs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like Mr. Jobs. <laughs> I love Mr. Jobs. Oh. So I'm sure you'll enjoy yes. reading. I will, actually. I've got a bit of time now. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, very inspiring person. One mm. of the things I want to do some more training on yes. is to actually use Steve Jobs and give courses on how people can and how companies can have the level of innovation that yes, he brought. Yes, yes, yes. What he did is fantastic, mm. but it's not that strange, yes. not that unusual, a focus on excellence yes. and a whole range of, of other things. Yes. And although people won't become a Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. they can create massive changes yes. in their companies by using some of uh, what he did. Oh, thank uh, you. So, well, thank you, and I'm glad to have been a part of the success story. Thank you so much. Congratulate, and thank you for the amazing work you've done for so many Ugandans. Thank you, you so much. can actually rely mm. on their pension. Uh, uh, their pension, the absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, hope we can be in touch. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. Next phase. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Good.